Hi guys, so in today's episode, I'm talking about mobility. Mobility has been a hot topic for the last few years in the health and fitness world. And if you go online, you'll see multiple different options and programs and way to improve your mobility, which can be really confusing and cause you not to take action. Mobility is incredibly important in your training. First of all, it helps to reduce the risk of injury and also to make you more efficient. If you lack mobility in certain areas, your body will have to compensate using less effective movement patterns. For example, if you're tight in your hips, you may end up losing stability in your knees or in your midline to be able to pick a barbell up from the floor. If you're tight overhead, pressing the bar overhead, Again, you're going to sacrifice stability in the midsection to be able to press that bar. And you're going to bring yourself at bigger risk of injury. In addition, you just won't be able to move as much weight because you won't be moving efficiently. The other problem with lacking mobility is you can't train through the full range of motion of the joint and therefore you can't use all of the muscles that are available. So not only are you not going to move as much weight, but you're also not going to train as much muscles. You're not going to get the same amount of benefit as if you can train through that full range of motion. Now we don't need to be Olympic gymnasts, we don't need to be contortionists to have a functional range of motion. We just need to be able to perform movements effectively and efficiently with perfect form. So there is an ideal and optimum range of motion we need to get to. We don't need to go beyond that. We don't need to perform party tricks, but we do need to get to our best range of motion that we can achieve because it is, does vary genetically from person to person, but we should all be able to move pretty well through most of the movements that you will see in CrossFit training, regular training. So what causes that lack of mobility? Well, the first thing that causes our lack of mobility is just lack of movement. If you're not moving through movement patterns on a regular basis, you are going to lose those patterns. You're going to lose that training you have. So. One of the reasons that we don't squat very well as a society is that we very rarely move down into a deep squat beyond the age of two. Once we get beyond that age, we tend to sit on chairs. So therefore we're only sitting really at 90 degrees. We rarely use that squat pattern. And if you're not squatting on a regular basis, you just won't move through that pattern. It's a bit like if you don't move a door through its full range of motion, it will start to rust up around hinges. That's basically what happens to us. And that combined with just other poor movement patterns that we possess, for example, if we're always sitting and working at a desk, we're going to create a rounded upper back. We create tightness through our chest and the front of our shoulders, through our thoracic spine. And we're going to be limited in our ability to go overhead. All of these lack of movements all of these lack of movements, all of these movements that we don't do on a regular basis will become limited by that factor. So if we're not using it, we are going to lose it. And the extent to which you do that depends on how poor we are with our posture, how little we move on a day-to-day -day basis. Also, if we're doing something on a repetitive basis, in other words, if we are, let's say, uh, a gym bro, as what's called, and just bench pressing and bicep curling all day, we're going to create a position where we're quite restricted because we're doing all of our work in an anterior position in front of us. We're not doing anything that's, that's going to help open our bodies up. We're not going to rotate or uh, go through big ranges of extension, scapular retraction, all of those things we need to do. And we're going to create restrictions there. So you'll see, you know, through sport as well, cycling, all those other things that we do, we can cause ourselves to be more and more restrictive by making muscles tighter and not using other muscles which makes them weaker, just ingraining poor motor patterns and poor posture patterns in our bodies. So the first thing is, let's get moving. That's the first way you're going to improve mobility. The number of clients that I have that I don't specifically work on mobility with, but their mobility improves purely by engaging in more movement patterns. A lot of the time, it's just a matter of greasing the groove, just moving people into positions that they don't move into on a regular basis. So getting them into the habit of moving into good positions. If you fight in your training for great positions, 
there will be a huge benefit in your range of motion and in your quality of movement. So if you do nothing with regards to specific mobility training, you can still do the majority of what you need to do just by moving better, by making a conscious effort to get down to that bottom position in your squat, to get those arms overhead and not just arms straight, but arms overhead when you're pressing overhead, to allow yourself to move through a full hang when you're hanging from the barbell, to get a good, strong, solid position when you're bowing forward in deadlifts and remaining in deadlifts, all those hinge positions, making sure you're moving through your hips, using your burpees and jumping your feet as far forward as you can, getting up to full hip extension. All of these movement patterns are great ways to improve your mobility. So number one in my tips to improve mobility is fight for positions. That is going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. Before you do anything specific, work hard to get into great positions. People want to improve the front rack in their cleans and in their front squats. They need to work on holding a front rack in their cleans and their front squat in a better position. Don't make the excuse that, oh, I'm too stiff and therefore I need to work on my mobility. So for now, I'm just going to have a crap position and accept that because I'm not going to take the time to work on my mobility. Well, you're working on your mobility in every single rep you do and you're ingraining movement patterns with every single rep you do remember that i come from a background of golf coaching golf playing golf to a high level and do you know that every single repetition you put in when you're playing golf is ingraining good or bad form so you have to work for good form otherwise you are just wasting your time you're going backwards with the way you're training Think about this when you are training. Ensure you are scaling the intensity of the movement to allow you to move well. When we do our CrossFit Level 1 training course, which is the first basic level of coach training that you do, you talk about that threshold of quality. We want athletes to be moving fast at a high level of intensity at the limits of their movement quality. So we want the movement quality to still be good with the intensity staying high. Now, if that, the movement quality drops, we have to drop the intensity to ensure that quality remains at a level we want it to be at. We're not looking for absolute perfection all of the time, but we are looking for good, high quality, people working hard for their reps. And when you haven't got that intensity in the workout, we are looking for perfection. So when you're doing warm-ups, when you're doing skill work, when you're doing work where you have the opportunity to put more focus on quality, put that focus on quality. I cannot stress this enough. So don't just look at go wad, rom wad, all of those apps that are available, or start reading the supple leopard by Kelly Sterrett or looking at the latest video that Coach Dennis puts out on, on mobility and think, oh, I'll do that tomorrow. Today is the time where you're going to work on your mobility, and that's by making sure you put in good reps. The amount of people I say, oh yeah, they've been working on my mobility, I've been doing some foam rolling, I've been doing my stretching, and then I see them in the gym, and I know they can do a better quality rep, but they are putting in the most horrendous push jerks, or crappy efforts in their squats, wobbles, air squats, probably number one in my list of poorly executed reps. People not bothering to go to full range of motion, and when they get to full range of motion, not bothering to ensure that their chest is up, they've got a strong midline, and they're maintaining movement quality. Don't make the excuse of mobility when you are working out to allow you to move poorly. That is so important. I cannot stress that enough. I'm going to keep saying it because it is so important. You need to make sure you're moving through the best quality of movement, through the best range of motion, Every rep needs to count. Those mechanics are crucial for you to get better and you will get better 
aesthetics, which is the number one reason we come to the gym. Don't come and tell me, oh, the reason I come to the gym is to just be healthier. I want to feel better. If you don't look in the mirror and look better, you are not going to feel the benefits of going to the gym. So don't try and just say it's just to be healthier. We all know deep down we want to look better naked. That is the reality that is there. Yes, we want to be healthier. Yes, we don't want to die from chronic disease caused from obesity and lack of movement. But before all that, vanity comes number one. We want to be able to look good. And that is going to come from good quality movements. If you look crap when you're moving in the gym, do you think that's going to make you look better when you're out on a night out when you're training, when you're not training, sorry? No, it's not. Because those movement patterns you're ingraining in the gym are going to be reflected in how you look when you are walking around. Put the effort in, guys. Make an effort to look good in the gym. I don't mean buying some new leggings, all right? I mean look good with your movement. Think about how you look and feel those positions. And you don't need a mirror to feel your braced midline, to feel your elbows are up to feel you're going below parallel in the squat. You don't need a mirror. You can feel it. You can put some stuff down. You can definitely feel when your arms are extended overhead. Excuses number, another excuse, I haven't got a mirror, how would I know? You know, people know when they're going learner. People know when they're completing full range of motion. People know when their arms are overhead and they know when they're, when they're not doing that. Or if they don't know and they get told by a coach, they pretty quick, quickly correct it. So put some effort in. That's number one, okay? And I've spoken a lot about it a lot because it really annoys me, people making excuses of mobility for poor form. I've got crap mobility, all right? I have pretty good shoulder mobility, pretty good by the standard of a 42-year-old guy who spent a lot of time doing bodybuilding-style gym training for a long time, but pretty good. I've got not so bad hip mobility and I've got probably the worst ankle mobility. I'm not going to go on about that because if you're a member of the CrossFit Chilton gym, you'll know I talk about it all the time. All right. I am doing something about it, but the main thing I'm doing is I'm training to try and improve that. I'm working on getting deeper in results. But with that, some serious joint issues, you do need to put in more work. And that's where I'm going to next. If you're putting in great reps, as good as you personally can do, you're trying your hardest, you're getting to the bottom position in your squat and it's hurting in a good way because you're really having to fight and make sure that your feet are in good alignment, your knees are in good alignment, your chest is pulled up, you're keeping that brace, you are getting as close to below parallel as you possibly can, whether that's unloaded or loaded, but you still find limitations, then you need to go to the next stage in your mobility training. What's next? Because there's lots of different options. Well, the restrictions in your mobility can come from a variety of reasons. And some of these are not going to go through in detail today because there's so many different issues. One of them could be caused by a lack of stability in certain areas of your body. You think about glute stability, you think about midline stability, core stability, you think about upper back strength. All of those can cause issues that can reflect in your flexibility because your body will compensate for a lack of stability in one joint by restricting other joints to create more stability. So it will restrict certain areas to make up for a lack of stability in an area up and down the chain of your body. Let's not go there right now because that's another whole uh, podcast episode to go through. And I don't want to waste that. That's one we can talk about in much more detail. But yes, it is important to understand that stability can cause restriction to your mobility because your body is very clever. It will try and correct issues that you have by using compensations and those compensations will cause more and more tightness. We do need to get there and seeing uh, a fitness professional who is good at identifying that is important if you have these issues. And if you find that with all the mobility work you do, you keep coming back to the same position, then yes, make sure you see someone uh, like myself who can help you with those. Let's, let's put that to one side. So let's say we, we worked on our stability, we're getting our stability good, and our body is no longer having to make compensations. 
biggest that we'll, we'll use that. We have mobility restrictions. Now, like I say, if it's just caused by lack of movement, a lot of times if you start moving, greasing that groove will improve that and you'll see quite a large improvement quite quickly in that. What you will find into your training, further into your training though, is that there are certain areas of mobility that are more stuck, that require a little bit more help than just fighting for position if you want to, to get there quicker. So what do we do about that? Well, we have to identify, first of all, where are our key areas? Because we don't want to be dedicating hours upon hours and hours of our time every day on mobility. The number one thing, if you want to improve mobility, is that you need to be doing it on a daily basis. There is, and thanks to um, Helen at American Sports Physios for bringing to light this evidence, and I've, I've gone and had a look at this myself after she told me this, but there is ample evidence to suggest that it's the frequency of which you work on your mobility is the key to improving mobility. Performing mobility daily, five times a week, three times a week, there is a clear difference in how quickly you improve and also how much of the mobility that you're working on is retained with the frequency of, how, of, of training, of mobility training. So if you work on mobility seven days a week, you're going to move much faster to where you need to be and the work that you've done, because what often when you work on mobility, what will, you'll find is immediately following your mobility session, you will be more mobile. Okay, you should be able to see that. That's one thing uh, Dr. Kelly Starrett talks about this, is you should be able to test before a session, retest after a session, and you should definitely see a clear improvement in your mobility. If not, you need to look at the methods you're using and are they getting results, are they effective? Otherwise, you're kind of wasting your time. So you should see some results there. But what will happen is, as the time moves on that those improvements will regress so if you just let's say you make a two percent improvement which would be quite good uh, in one session i'd say it's a huge improvement <laughs> you will find that in 24 hours later it might be one percent and then 48 hours later it might be 0.5 and so on and so forth so if you take big gaps between your mobility you'll, you'll take it two steps forward two steps backward we need to make sure we're training frequently so seven to five days a week would be if you're looking for good results that's going to be the minimum we're looking for. So that's why it's important we triage the key areas of our mobility because we just haven't got time to work on everything every single day. We need a small window of time each day where we work on the key areas we want to improve. So identify those areas. Most people you'll find the, the key areas to look at are ankle mobility, hip mobility, and thoracic spine slash shoulder mobility. But more often it's the upper back that's the issue rather than just the shoulders. So those are the, the three key areas for not just CrossFit, just in general, when you see people, you're gonna see problems with their posture in the upper body. So they have restrictions with getting their arms overhead or behind them. And that's where you're going to see some issues with more high risk of injury from throwing a ball or throwing up a snatch in uh, CrossFit terms. Hip mobility is a massive issue, especially as we get older, we seem to see more and more um, older athletes with problems with their hips, whether that's external rotation, internal rotation of the hip, or also just getting into extension, hip extension even, and hip flexion. So really, that's a, a key area to look at. And if we, most mobility programs you see will focus on the hip mobility. And ankle mobility is massive, and obviously in my personal experience it's, it's the, the biggest thing for me but it, it's specific each movement so i'd look at those three areas what is the key part to work on and triage that pick that out first now we've decided that we have to work on our mobility we have to work on it on a daily basis so we've triaged it to one or two joints that we want to work on and if it is two joints maybe just specific movement patterns within that joint will be the key but what works? Because what causes mobility restrictions? We've talked about how lifestyle is one of the main causes. Injury can be another cause. Some kind of trauma can obviously cause in, um, restrictions in the joint and just repetitive use. So we've got those three things, lifestyle, injury, repetitive use. 
Now, the restriction can be just lack of use. There can also be a scar tissue buildup in that joint or just a general joint dysfunction. So if you've got scar tissue, the best way to remove that is through manual therapy or to help loosen that is through manual therapy. So actually getting a professional to work on that. It's very difficult to self release scar tissue. People talk about foam rollers. Self foam rollers are myofascial release. They are really just improving the tonality. So making the joint a little bit more pliable before you start doing mobility work. They are not a miracle cure. They don't really break down scar tissue. You can't really get enough force in there to do that. If, if it was that easy, then when you put a barbell on your back, you know, you'd probably break down scar tissue if you've got a, you know, squatting 150 kilos, your traps must really loosen off, but they don't. Okay, so there has to be a, a real concerted effort and manual therapy is the best way. Other options are voodoo band flossing, maybe more aggressive smashing with a barbell or a kettlebell. So quite aggressive techniques going in there. Um, like I say, foam roller is more really improving pliability and other, other versions of manual therapy, Graston technique, uh, acupuncture, those are all ways to get the scar tissue uh, more broken down. It's the, it's the um, collagen that will bind together and that scar tissue is effectively stopping our muscles from being able to move through their full range of motion. So that's the first thing is we need to look at what's in there. So some manual therapy can be really helpful. If not, have a look. I, I really like the Kelly Starrett book. I think it's quite useful for your own self maintenance. Have a look at Supple Leopard by Kelly Starrett. It's really good. There's plenty of information online as well on, on ways to help, but just be clear that doing stuff yourself is not going to be as effective and there's not a great deal of evidence with regards to how beneficial foam rollers are at actually breaking down scar tissue. They are useful, but like I say, um, making the muscles more pliable for when you're doing something further with that, but don't waste a lot of time with foam roller work. Your time is better spent on actually mobilizing those joints. So if you're going to do foam roller, it's just going to be 30 seconds just to help to soften and get those joints ready for what you're going to do next. The time is better spent and we need to be time efficient, we talk about that now, on actually mobilizing, moving that joint through ranges of motion, which is where flossing with a voodoo floss band can be useful because you're applying some kind of force to it and you can mobilize at the same time or also using uh, bands, so monster bands, rogue monster bands, those tight pull-up bands to put your joints into better position can be useful and hopefully apply a bit of pressure to that tissue as well. So yes, look at manual therapy, look at some tools you can use to help with that scar tissue. After that, your time is best spent if you're doing a daily practice, doing more mobilization, active mobilization than anything else. Active mobilization, well, it can be something as simple as, like I say, moving through a good range of motion. But if we're being specific on a joint, it would be moving that joint specifically through the range of motion you're looking to improve. So you're looking to improve ankle dorsiflexion. A good way is to put your foot flat on the floor, keeping your heel down and driving your knee forward over your toes whilst keeping your heel on the floor. There's a way to improve your ankle dorsiflexion and Active versions of that would be moving it backwards and forwards. This is a good thing to do prior to a workout. So if we're looking to fight for positions, well, if we can ho hopefully mobilize some of those joints into better positions, sorry, better ranges of motion, sorry, prior to a workout, then that will improve our movements. And if we uh, do the active mobilizations first, move through the patterns we're looking to improve, we should get a more rapid benefit from that form of training. So active mobilization is a great way to go. Like I say, it's really moving the joints through the patterns you want them to move through actively. So backwards and forwards, not just holding a static, static position. And it's always good to follow up any joint mobilization, specific joint mobilization with a more global motor pattern to ingrain those pathways into your body. So moving through the, the gross motor pattern, the big movement pattern, after we've done a specific joint mobilization is a great way to get our body used to moving through better ranges of motion. Now, there's loads of different active mobility uh, options out there. 
if you, if you follow Coach Dennis, uh, Conroy Performance, he does functional range conditioning. And one of the key things they do is moving joints through full ranges of motion. It's a really good uh, system of movement patterns. So I do suggest checking that out. I will hopefully at some point get Coach Dennis on the podcast to talk a little bit more about what he does with that. I know he's releasing some ebooks soon, so it's quite an exciting time. So I'll definitely get him on to talk a little bit more about his solution to mobility. But that's a really good way to do it. So active mobilization is key. You should always have some active mobilization in your mobility work. If you're training, do it before a workout. Also, I like to see it done prior to a stretching regime. So we like to stretch really, most of the time you want to be stretching prior, sorry, post-workout or post-active mobilization. That's how I would recommend people do it. You can stretch before a workout and it will give you a bigger range of motion, but I would put a little disclaimer in that you're putting your body into, if you are stretching, you're obviously going even further with that range of motion work. And you're doing that prior to work, you're putting your body in positions and maybe there isn't as much stability there as there was prior to mobilizing. So you are going to lose some stability and there's some evidence that you will lose a little bit of power pre-workout. So do not stretch before big workouts where you're trying to break PRs. But if you're going to do a workout where you're moving through those patterns under control, then yes, by all means, add some stretching in beforehand. But just be aware that you may lose some stability in that joint because you've obviously loosened it. You've increased the range of motion. You have to be aware of that when you are working out following stretching but most of the time you're going to stretch either after a workout which can just be a way of reducing some of that tension that's been built up during the workout and that's great but to improve mobility you can do after workout or at the end of the day and there's two main ways to stretch the first one is static long hold stretches and the second one is pnf or contract relax stretching there's benefits to both. So a static stretch is where you just move into a stretch position. You know, the most common static stretch people do would be lying on their back and bringing their leg up straight into a hamstring stretch, maybe putting a towel behind their feet and just holding a stretch through there or just holding different yoga positions is a way of static stretching. And the other form is contract relax stretching, which is where you effectively get the muscle close to the end range so where you start to feel a slight stretch and then you actually physically contract the muscle you're stretching. So if you were stretching your hamstring and you had it in a towel, you were lying on your back with your leg elevated, you could push into the towel to create a little bit of stretch, a little bit of contraction in your hamstring. So you actually feel your hamstring working. And what that will do is fatigue that muscle and allow you to move it a little bit further on. Now there's benefits to both forms of stretching. Before I talk about that, the first thing you need to be aware of though is when we're talking about stretching a muscle, it can be confused with the thought that you're actually making the muscle longer. Tissue length cannot be changed. Tissues are tissues, they are your muscles, okay? If tissue length could be changed, um, we would be like Mr. Elastic, okay? We could actually stretch out, you maybe, maybe we can even elongate our skeleton, I don't know. But tissue length doesn't actually change. What changes is the ability for that muscle to move through a longer range of motion. So if you think about the muscles, they're made up with loads and loads of different fibers that are interwoven together. And as we, when we contract the muscle, those fibers get tighter together. And when we relax the muscle, we go through the eccentric phase of the movement. Those, those fibers will begin to separate. This action is controlled by the brain the cocky tendon. And so it's allowed, it's a neural action. So our brain is allowing us to go through a certain range of motion and contract with a certain, certain range of motion with the exception of specific joint restrictions. I'm talking about muscle length. Muscle contractions are allowed to happen by the brain. Okay, there's a, there's a signal to say when you are the end range of motion and that is called the goggly tendon reflex. When you're taking that muscle to the end range, there is a goggly tendon, a reflex action that will tell the, the muscle to contract and stop going any further to prevent the risk of injury. So when we are stretching, what we're actually trying to do is to 
train our bodies that it is safe to move through a larger range of motion. We're allowing our muscles to start to relax and realize you can move through a bigger range of motion and that will cause them to, in effect, elongate, but actually just allow to, to lengthen within themselves, to relax further, let's call it that. That's really important to know because if you just think, I can, get, I can physically stretch the tissue, then the best way to stretch would be to apply as much force as possible, maybe inject yourself with as much painkiller as possible and just get, the, get yourself actually cranked on and loaded on. You know, get someone to rip your leg so it touches the ground behind you and you're stretching it out and that will, that will make, remain long. That does not happen. It has to be a neurological response. There's a neural lock that stops that muscle from relaxing and moving through a larger range of motion. That's so important to know and it's so um, misunderstood, the, the action of stretching. So people take stretches and their tears coming down their eyes and they're like, yeah, push harder, push harder. That's not going to help. The stretching itself, the elongation of the muscle, it's not even about stretching, the elongation of the muscle, the, the, the muscle being allowed to move through a large range of motion happens by our bodies relaxing into those positions and understanding, I know the, bus, the, the brain doesn't understand, but just think of it that way, it understands that it can move safely through a larger range of motion. So we're effectively convincing it to do that. That means that when you are stretching, you need to be able to relax. And the breathing is part of that. Parasympathetic breathing should be part of your stretching. Parasympathetic breathing, if you haven't done it before, is yoga breathing, breathing through your belly, having that level of relaxation where you're not holding tension in your neck and your shoulders, but you're breathing through. It doesn't mean that when you hold a stretch initially, you feel some tension, but you have to be able to breathe through that and allow that muscle to relax and move through a large range of motion for it to have any benefit. If you're constantly fighting a stretch, you won't actually improve. In fact, you actually get tighter because your muscle will fight and tighten to prevent you from taking it to a dangerous range of motion. Have that in mind with whatever stretching protocol you are using. It's a neurological or a neural effect, not a physical act of stretching tissue to whatever point it will go to. I mean, that would be much quicker if you could do that, but it doesn't happen. They've tested muscle fibers before and they've shown it doesn't matter what load you apply to them they are one length they don't stretch okay so really think about that in your training let's talk about long hold stretches and contract relax stretching as i say before there is benefits to both the more efficient way to improve your mobility is by incorporating some form of contract, relax, stretch. It is shown to be more effective at improving range of motion through a joint. So applying a contraction, a short contraction in the muscle and then relaxing further through that and doing that multiple times will get you more effective results in your range of motion. Long hold stretching allows you to spend more time in one position and breathe through that for a longer period of time and relax more. My argument for the contract relax sounded like that would be my recommendation. The problem with contract relax stretching is compliance. What I mean by that is people don't tend to do it because it's a bit harder to do. It's harder work. Just lying in a position and breathing and going through parasympathetic breathing, allowing your body to relax through positions is much easier to do on a daily basis, especially at the end of the day or after a workout than working through these contract, relaxed positions. Yes, it's really, really good and it is actually more effective, but if you're not doing it every day, it's not that effective. As we talked about before, you have to be doing a mobility five to seven days a week to get benefit. Static long hold stretching has a much better rate of compliance. So you will see more results for more people in that. That's my opinion. That's what I've seen from myself and my clients. What I suggest you do is, yes, if you are feeling in the mood to do contract relaxed stretching, do that because it's more effective. 
But if contract relaxing is going to put you off stretching that night, just go through some long hold positions. It's much better to be frequent with your training than to skip the training just because it sounds like too much hard work on that session. Tailor the mobility session to suit how you are feeling that day, but make sure you don't skip the mobility session. Let's go through now a summary of what I think are your best ways to improve mobility. We're talking about time efficiency, first of all. We don't have a lot of time in our hands to be spending hours on it. We're not professional athletes, most of us, so we need to be efficient with our time. So first things first, if you have no time at all, your mobility work is every time you train, going through the perfect position you can, working hard to fight for great positions, especially in your warm-ups, in your skill development sessions, and any time where there isn't high levels of intensity. But then even if there is high levels of intensity, you should still be working hard to hit positions, should still be in your brain. Intensity should not overtake mechanics at any point in your training, apart from if you're in a competition, which for most of us is very rare. That's number one, always fight for positions. If you're not doing that, don't come to me asking for mobility help because that will be what I say to you before you do anything else. I say, well, you haven't done that first. So don't be asking me anything else because you're using mobility as an excuse to be lazy in the gym and lazy in terms of movement quality. Second thing is ensure you are applying some active mobilizations prior to workouts and just on a regular daily basis. Those active mobilizations can be gross movement patterns. So in other words, moving through the patterns you're trying to improve, deep squats, overhead press, whatever it is, make sure you're doing active work through there. And that's exactly as I talked about a second ago when I was saying about putting in the effort in the workouts to fight for positions. The gross movement motor patterns are great. Specific joint mobilization is also really important. Taking that joint through the ranges of motion you need to develop. That has to happen prior to workouts and should be a daily practice as well. Keep greasing the groove of that joint. Think of that joint as a hinge. You have to be moving it through the range of motion on a regular basis to loosen it off. That is key. Number three is apply some form of stretching to that joint. Whichever form you choose, I don't mind, but it has to be on a regular basis. And you have to spend at least, at least 30 seconds in the position, whichever position or whichever style of stretching you choose, you have to spend at least 30, position, 30 seconds working on that end range. Remember, stretching requires parasympathetic breathing. You need to be able to relax into the stretch. You can feel tension, but then you have to feel the relaxation happen. If you're fighting because it's so painful, take it down a notch. You will not improve mobility by fighting and trying to break yourself into those positions. It's only when you relax, you get the benefit. So if it's a little bit painful at first and it starts to ease off, that's great. If it's a little bit painful at first and it starts to get better, well, worse and you get tighter, ease it off. They're my three keys. Fight for position, active mobilizations, some form of stretching. You have to do it daily at best, five times a week at worst. And this is why triage is key. Sort out what you want to do and be specific so that you can spend the time that you have on those specific areas. Don't try and fix everything in one go because you just won't be able to spend the time and therefore you won't see results. If you don't see results, you'll stop doing it. If you feel like the worst part of your body to improve is the hip, work on the hip mobility. If it's hip extension, work specifically on that and see if you can improve those positions. If you try and fix everything, you'll fix nothing. Once you've applied these three areas, other aspects are the icing on the cake. Manual therapy, I would suggest everyone has manual therapy, but it depends on your budget and your time. But manual therapy will be really beneficial, especially in real problem areas where there may be a buildup of adhesions in the muscle, in other words, points where the muscle is bind together and where there's scar tissue as well. If you're not doing any therapy, then yes, you can apply other 
self manual therapy techniques. They won't be quite as beneficial, but they will have some use. But don't waste time on your mobilization, that you could be using a mobilization on these other therapies. A lot of these things are really good for getting you ready for a workout or recovery post-workout, but in terms of increasing your mobility, there's a lot of limit to that and the time is much better spent doing the actual mobilization of the joint rather than trying to just hammer it with a uh, percussion massager or roll it out or get a lacrosse ball in there or a spiky ball. They are just ways to help the, the, the tonality of the muscle and elicit some form of relaxation which can help with pain relief, get you feeling better. But don't mistake that for mobility work. Frequent training, triage, so you can dedicate your time effectively, actively mobilize whilst fighting for positions and stretch. That's how you're going to see an improvement in your mobility. Thanks for listening, guys. I hope that's been helpful. Any questions or comments, please drop me an email, jeremy at crossfitchildren.com. Stay tuned for some more episodes.